Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, and most importantly, thank you very much for listening. And thank you for supporting the show, those of you who have decided to do so. Go to jeffersonhour.com. You can find out details on just how you can help support the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We need it. We so appreciate it. And uh, if you're not in a position to donate to the show, write us a letter. Uh, Tell us what you like about the show, what you don't like about the show, and ask questions. We certainly appreciate that. The listener-generated programs are some of my very favorites. We always take that correspondence very seriously, and we welcome suggestions and criticism and praise, but only if it's deserved. You know, the program we just did, David, is about um, the presidency, but we wanted to use the Zoom technology that is now changed American life to bring our um, listeners in. Um, So we had a meeting with them, a town meeting, uh, and we had dozens of them in, in their postage stamp visages on a Zoom platform. Uh, And after a brief conversation between the two of us, we turned to our listeners, some of whom we're seeing for the first time. We'll be doing more of that, in fact, quite a bit more of that. And and some of them will be on weekends, some of them will be in the evening, some of them will be in the afternoon. We want to make sure we move them around a little bit so that we can accommodate people who have to go to work or who have other reasons not to be able to meet at a certain time. I really, really enjoy this. I like seeing the people who listen to this program. And I, of course, I'm always happiest when we're engaged in conversation with our listeners rather than just speaking here in the virtual New Enlightenment Radio Network barn. If any of you are interested in participating in one of these Zoom town halls, just keep listening to the show. We'll try to update you on the scheduling or go to jeffersonhour.com and you can find out more. We had a, a number of very interesting questions early on talked about presidents who were able to sing the song of America, which I I said in the show is something that uh, it's a phrase that you used early on in my tenure as a semi-permanent guest host. And it it struck me so much that I've always watched for that, both in conversations with you, Mr. Jefferson, and in contemporary candidates. And it seems to me, and I talked about this in the show, but it seems to me that candidates who are able to utilize that sing the song of America. Maybe you could explain that better. They seem to be the ones that are most successful. We are an inherently optimistic people. How could we not be coming over from the old world and finding this incredible new continent, a lightly peopled continent whose resources have not ever been exploited? Uh, There it was. And uh, when Jefferson looked uh, to the future, he saw an infinity of land to the west. You know, uh, we now have a much more complicated view of that because we know that native peoples were living there and they would be displaced in order to fulfill Jefferson's idea and others of the American dream. But their optimism, the founding fathers and Jefferson's in particular, were huge. They saw that we would have a permanent middle class because we had land in the West. They understood that the, the continent was a resource base that would make us wealthy that we were separated by 3,000 miles from the old world, etc. And so Jefferson is the first of the, the optimists. Uh, John Adams, not so much. George Washington was a more stately figure, uh, but he wasn't likely to gush much. But Jefferson was a dreamy sort of visionary who had this really extraordinary optimism about the future of the human project. And so he brought that to the presidency, and successful presidents have tended to follow in that lead. Think of Ronald Reagan mourning in America after what was regarded as a more uh, gloomy period following Watergate and the administration of Jimmy Carter. And and Donald Trump, whether you like him or not, uh, in saying we're going to make America great again, appealed to millions and millions of Americans who, who want America to be everything that they expect it to be that they dream of. And of course, people get different ideas of what that dream should be. But but touching that note, that the inherent optimism of the American people um, is an essential form. John Kennedy had it, although, you know, in the middle of the, of, of, of the Cold War, really at the darkest period of the Cold War, he nevertheless brought great idealism and a sense of a new frontier, a new era. He said the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans and that they were going to bring about an extraordinary progress, and did. 
And so that um, is a really Im important characteristic of, of some presidents. Others uh, d don't really see it that way. Others uh, are more administrative. Some are actually even a bit pessimistic. Uh, but that, that rarely works. That usually leads to a one-term presidency. We had a number of interesting questions. We talked about divisive presidents, consequential presidents. Uh, there was a question about presidents who grew into the office or changed while they were in office. And there was one question from a gentleman who wanted to know if we thought it would elections would ever be, quote, normal again. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting show. But before we go to it, uh, any updates you have, Clay, about your many endeavors? It's a, it's a busy time for me, but I'm loving it. So the Constitution course that I've been teaching uh, is, is nearly over. We're, we'll be doing it again, so stay tuned, everyone. The next courses, the online courses, and I'm really strongly urging you to consider these. The next one uh, is about uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer. You know, we did the Oppenheimer uh, retreat at Laksa Lodge, and many people who wanted to come couldn't because of, of COVID concerns. So we're going to do it again between March 6th and 27th, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the decision to drop the atomic bomb, the building of the atomic bomb, life at Los Alamos, quantum mechanics, and so on. It sounds um, technical and, and maybe pessimistic, but it's not at all. Oppenheimer is an utterly fascinating man. So that's March 6th through 27th. Then on April 10th through May 1st, something of such enormous importance to me, David, I'm teaching a, a four-week um, online course on Hamlet, which, which I regard as the greatest single piece of English literature, maybe the greatest single piece of literature, a book that changed my life when I first read it as a freshman uh, at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Um, Hamlet is, uh, for me, uh, a, a play, a book that I return to several times per year. Um, and I, I have a method to help people understand it. You know, the, the, some people are intimidated by Shakespeare, um, because it's the language is a little bit difficult and it, it happens so fast uh, when you're watching it and, and there are so many sort of um, interesting imaginative conceits and figurative language and uses of Renaissance rhetoric when you're trying to read it. But I can help people do that. In fact, I'm writing a, a line by line, scene by scene commentary on Hamlet uh, in preparation for the class. And I'm going to publish it afterwards, um, you know, so that anyone anywhere who wants to see Hamlet. Uh, through my commentary, we'll be able to do that. So that's April 10th through May 1st. Those are the, the next two are coming. And then next spring, Cuba, it's now definitely set. You can find out information on the website and John Steinbeck's California. So those are both on. We assume that by then the pandemic will be largely, if not entirely, in the rearview mirror. And so I can't wait um, to get back to Cuba. It, it was one of the most extraordinary moments of my life. And the Steinbeck um, retreat, which I do with my friend Russ Eagle, um, is just pure joy. Well, great. That's a lot. You've got a busy 2021 coming up. And with that, sir, shall we go to the show? Yes. And, and for everyone, we'll do more of these um, as if live uh, Zoom um, programs. They're great fun. So watch for them. We'll probably be doing roughly one every six weeks, maybe even more often. So join us on this one. You get a sampling of it and then uh, plan to be part of, of one of the next uh, Zoom editions, town hall meetings of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. So thanks for listening. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, another of our Thomas Jefferson Hour Zoom town halls, where we invite listeners to join us and present questions. You can find out more about our upcoming Zoom Town Halls at jeffersonhour.com. I'm your host, David Swenson. We're joined this week by our apt administrator, Beth, and the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And Clay, it was you who chose the subject for this week's discussion, presidential character. Presidential leadership and presidential character, and with your indulgence, Beth and David and all of you, I just want to say a few words uh, about that. So I made some lists today as I was sort of thinking this through. And there, I guess the takeaway from this, David, is that there is no single type of presidential leadership. 
successful presidents come in many different varieties. Uh, there isn't a single path, a single character set that leads to a successful presidency. And so I was thinking, first of all, of our mutual friend Thomas Jefferson, since he's the reason, in a sense, we're all here. And I tried to make a list of what I took to be his capacities, his what he brought to the presidency of the United States. And so there are one, two, three, four, five, six characteristics that I have here. And David, then I want you to comment when I finish. First of all, and you know this one is coming, David. Jefferson sang the song of America. Yeah. Be a successful president. Jefferson taught us that you have to sing the optimistic song of American possibility. That this, that, you know, his first inaugural address, this wide and fruitful country with room enough for the hundredth and the thousandth generation, and all of that sort of talk about American optimism, American possibility, the greatness of America, American exceptionalism this extraordinary experiment in human liberty and so on. Uh, that's uh, Jefferson. He certainly sang that in the first inaugural address. And he said in a letter of that time, it's not true that there's nothing new under the sun. There is something new under the sun. This whole continent is new. It's people, this form of government that we're attempting is new and so on and so forth. The second quality of Jefferson's leadership is administrative mastery. Among other things, he was just one of the great administrative masters in American history. And so just to contrast him, Ronald Reagan was a great president in other respects, but administrative mastery wasn't that quality in him. There are certain presidents who have this ability or this focus to just handle the paperwork with extraordinary uh, skill and dispatch. And Jefferson actually, at a time when the country was much simpler, reported that he sometimes was working at his desk eight, nine, 10, even 12 hours per day as the third president of the United States. And, and the world was so much simpler then that he insisted that all of his cabinet officers, of which there were only four, uh, funnel every piece of correspondence through him, that he read every piece of mail um, under the aegis of the, of the executive branch of the government of the United States. And he was Jefferson was always the best prepared person in every room. He had done the hardest reading, taken the most copious notes, uh, outlined his positions. And this is uh, one really important source of his greatness. A third, and this is sort of a paradox, Jefferson was a, was a government minimalist. You know, in theory, he said he was an anarchist, no government at all. But knowing that we would have to have some government, his goal was the tiniest and most minimal government that could hold our social fabric together. And so this is a really odd thing for a president to do because presidents want to accomplish things. They want to build something. They want to create something. They want to leave their mark. But Jefferson wanted to leave his mark by reducing the national debt as severely as possible, which he did. He retired 37% of Hamilton's national debt which meant that he had almost no public money for anything else. And so he starved the national government because he thought that debt retirement was a much more important uh, mission. And many of the things he would have liked to have done, he wanted a national university, he wanted a national library system, he wanted internal improvements, what we would call an infrastructure bill. But he didn't do any of those things because he felt that it would be a mistake until such time as we had cleared the debt, or it's certainly gotten it down to manageable proportions. And so he's really one of the few presidents who um, set himself up to be a minimalist and not a maximalist. The fourth quality of Jefferson is what I would call the small R Republican quality, that he, a lot of what he did is political theater to show that we're not a monarchy, we're not an aristocracy, we're not going to have a high-toned central government. And so you all know he walked to his inauguration. He refused a military escort. He dressed in plain gentleman's clothes. Uh, his inaugural address, he, he uh, spoke in barely a whisper. Uh, then he had a very casual presidential protocol in which he abolished seating charts at the White House. And he uh, met people at the door in his slippers. He didn't have a, like an, a, a palace guard to protect him from visitors. He corresponded with average Americans. He traveled around on horseback without any escort whatsoever. 
in the District of Columbia and beyond. And, and although this fit his style, uh, he was an unpretentious man. Uh, it also was political theater. He was trying to correct what he took to be the monarchical abuses of his two predecessors, and then just two more. Um, he knew the advantage of breaking bread together at a time when Washington was really uh, without any significant amenities. It was just a raw little new national capital town. Jefferson had the best table in town, and he served two or three times per week these dinners in, in the afternoon around 3 p.m., and he would have 12 to 14 guests. Often they were members of Congress, carefully chosen by Jefferson himself to, to create the ideal balance of people. But he also brought in scientists and authors and explorers and, and men of letters and so on. And these dinners that were served with exquisite French wines, and beautiful French cuisine, were the most desired dining ticket, the most desired hospitality ticket in Washington, D.C. And even people who hated Jefferson virtually begged to be invited to dinner because Jefferson's meals were so superb. And then finally, and, and Jefferson said that this is, he'd never talked to politics. He never held forth. He always drew other people out in conversation at these famous dinners. But he said that people cooperate. They, they like each other. They, they have casual conversations. And then at some point during the meal, Jefferson would just say something to James Madison, like, I hope that tariff bill finds its way carefully through the Senate. And that was all the clue he needed to give to all the people there of what his politics were. And that leads to the final point that I wish to make. Jefferson had kind of a Zen leadership style. There's no discernible ego in Jefferson. He was not egoless. Of course, we know that. But he seemed to have no discernible ego. He, he was as mild and deferential and humble as you could possibly be. And at his dinners, although he was almost certainly the best informed person on most occasions, he held back and let others shine. And one of the things that I find most remarkable about him is that when they would go home, each person here say, would say, oh, Jefferson favored me. He listened most to me. He found my ideas most interesting. So if you add those, those qualities together, that makes a certain kind of president. It's Jefferson. It was successful, but it wasn't one of the great presidencies of all of the things that Jefferson did that we admire. The presidency isn't in the top five, I would say. It might not even be in the top 10, because that's not where he wanted to measure his contributions to human happiness or American life. And it also, because of this philosophy he had of minimalism, he couldn't be a president like Theodore Roosevelt, who, who grabbed power and wanted to do mighty things. So I'll stop there, David, just to get your sense of, of how you see Jefferson, or if you disagree with any of these thoughts. No, um, I, I agree with all of that. It, it does make me recall um, a much earlier time in my tenure here at the Jefferson Hour when I first heard you use the phrase or talk about how Jefferson knew how to sing the song of America, that really stuck with me, and I so much so that I'd watch for it, and I began to watch for it in contemporary candidates. Oh, we heard a little of that in the previous uh, presidential campaign and, and other candidates, and, and I think it's very important, and I think that candidates that know how to do that are the most successful. And of course, that that's a great strength of Jefferson's. We, we did a program a couple of weeks ago about his first inaugural address, which is a, a perfect example of that. But when you set this Zoom call up talking about presidential leadership and presidential character, it made me think of a recent book by Michael Beschloff, Presidents at War. And I'm going to read just a little bit from the preface of that. He writes, Presidents, step by step, have disrupted the founders' design. Were the founders to come back, they would probably be astonished and chagrined to discover that in spite of their ardent strivings, the life or death of much of the human race has now come to depend on the character of a single person who happens to be President of the United States. That very statement by Michael, Michael Beschloss would Paul Jefferson, because he believed that of the three branches of the national government, 
the legislative branch should be far and away supreme because it's the branch that leans most closely on the actual people, the sovereign, the will of the people, and that the executive branch should be subordinate and, and should not aggrandize itself, which is why he walked to his inauguration and met people in slippers and so on, because he, he worried that the founding fathers, and he was not one of them, he was not at Philadelphia in 1787, but he worried that the founders were, were, had already created a pretty strong executive, and that person, that that entity was only going to grow stronger over time. And so he played down the strength of the executive. I think he would be really uh, deeply alarmed by executive authority in the 21st century. And of course, we say it's a different world. Jefferson lived in a three mile per hour world. We live in a very different sort of world. But Jefferson was aghast by the idea of a strong executive. It, it smelled like a return to monarchy for him. And back to Michael Beschloff's book once more. He says, were the founders to come back, they would be astonished and chagrined at the amount of executive power. But once it's there, it's, it's hard to take away. We need to take just a short break. When we return, we'll have some questions for you, sir, from our listeners. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special Zoom Town Hall edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, recorded on February 11th, 2021. And it's time for us to turn to our listeners. And we'll go to our first question from Kirk Samuels. Kirk? I I really always love hearing about the Song of America and Jefferson. Um, And thinking about the presidents of my lifetime who've sung the song, um, certainly... I would hear Donald Trump sing that song. Um, he may add a few verses from a jukebox in a barroom brawl from time to time. <laughs> um, but I think the big thing when he sings a song, he's not singing it to all of America. He's singing it to his supporters and those people who voted for him and his, his, his uh, allegiant followers. But thinking on that, who certainly were the most divisive presidents um, in our history. Um, Probably Lincoln would have to go to the top since there was a civil war that split the country in two. I might even add about Obama that a lot of the divisions started there um, from the Republican and uh, social media and starting the the divide of our our country in two. But, But Clay, who do you think were the most divisive presidents in our in our country first i will say and i and i want to be careful here but i do think that one reason why donald trump became the president of the united states is that he did sing the song now he didn't i think sing it to everyone but he sang it very effectively to about 75 million americans and they heard it and we shouldn't despise that they heard about american possibility that it was going to be america first that we were going to be great that we were going to restore America, we were going to rebuild our infrastructure, that we were going to stop being uh, kicked around by the rest of the world and we're we're going to get tougher in our negotiations and so on. So there was an aggressive streak to that, but it also was this song. And I think that if you took an average MAGA person from, say, Montana or North Dakota here, uh, they, they heard that and it spoke to them about they wanted a restoration of something. Another president who did that, Kirk, was Ronald Reagan, Morning in America again, a little more uh, gently, but he also was saying, you know, after Jimmy Carter had been sort of a downer president in some ways, Reagan said, oh, come on, we're America, we're America. Anything is possible here. So that is just so important. As to divisive presidents, I think obviously Donald Trump is the most divisive president in my memory, but Obama turned out to be too. I'll come back to that. FDR was a terribly divisive president because what he attempted to do was to make government responsive to the to the crisis of the of of the dust bowl and the great depression and to do that he had to grow government in unprecedented ways and that led a lot of more conservative people to regard him as a menace as a socialist as somebody who was destroying um, our idea of limited government and states rights and so on. So he was, he was very divisive. And of course, LBJ, 
who could have been one of the truly greatest presidents had it not been for Vietnam, uh, wound up being an exceedingly divisive president because he clung to the idea of victory um, in Vietnam when it was clear that that was no longer going to be possible. And, and, and there certainly were others, but I think divisiveness sometimes is forced upon you. So again, going back to the, whatever you think of Barack Obama now, uh, just remember how uh, resoundingly he won when he won the first time and how many people who voted for him kind of breaking with their usual vote wound up eight years later voting for Donald Trump. So these were restless voters who were discontented and were looking for something different. And Obama seemed to be maybe that person. He seemed post-race. He seemed uh, articulate and elegant, and he had been against the war in Iraq and so on. And so he wins. But from the moment that he won, there was an enormous uh, anti-Obama movement. And some of it was policy. Some of it was style. But it turns out, as you look back on it now, a lot of it was race. And I think we underestimated that. And I don't want to, I don't want to use a broad brush for anti-Obama types. There are many reasons for people not to admire Barack Obama, especially for his policies, perhaps. For example, the Affordable Care Act, which many people simply objected to. But it turns out, I think, in the in the face of the Black Lives Matter movement and in the face of the Trump years, that we're realizing now that, that our racial divide is deeper and more deeply rooted than we thought. And I think we're horrified by that. We're horrified to think that we still have so long a path to go. We, I think we thought we were farther along. And the fact that we are not as far along as we hoped, at least for a, a significant percentage of us, is a really a deeply tr troubling feeling. Go ahead, Beth. Going to Cliff and Jean in Colorado. Hi, Clay. Thanks for putting this on. Um, you, uh, up until just a couple of minutes ago, very surprisingly, you had not mentioned FDR. Um, he has got to be, I mean, no matter how you look at it, short of Lincoln, our most unique president. He was elected four times. And if you look at the old newsreels or life magazines of, from January 1933, and then you go look at them from April of 1945. This country underwent the greatest change that it has ever seen in, in that short a period of time. Yes, FDR was considered divisive, but the man rose to meet incredible challenges that had he not, uh, who knows how the country would have turned. And I'm not necessarily singing his praises, but I, I don't know how you could leave FDR off any kind of an extraordinary presence list or the qualities he had is, is certainly something that needs to be, I think, re-examined. I completely agree with you. Uh, you know, if you make a list of consequential presidents, um, he is right at the top. And if, in my own opinion, if we were adding a fifth person to Mount Rushmore, I think FDR is that person. Um, now, just try that sometime um, and propose that to the country and watch the floor fight over that one. But in terms of consequential, you know, Theodore Roosevelt is a great man and a great president, not without some significant blemishes. But you know, he was he he presided over this country for seven years and 121 days because he you know he filled in for McKinley, and he renounced a third term, unlike his fifth cousin Franklin, who got a third end of part of a fourth, uh, when Theodore Roosevelt left office, he was a little chagrined and he couldn't really talk about it, but he felt it. And he, and he said, I, I can never be counted as one of the greats because I didn't preside over a real crisis, no war, no depression, no social calamity that my, my two terms were essentially a time of peace and prosperity. And so, although I might be regarded as a good president, I can never be regarded as one of the great presidents, like Lincoln, who was his hero, or George Washington. And so, of course, FDR, his fifth cousin, who was not as able intellectually as Theodore Roosevelt, turned out to be an unbelievably uh, good president for the time he served. And, uh, you know, you, I, whenever I hear people decrying FDR and the New Deal, I think, well, yeah, you didn't live 
in that era. Um, I know lots of people here in North Dakota who were dyed in the wool Hoover Republicans who later said, FDR saved my farm. And FDR brought electricity to our farm for the first time. FDR gave us social security without which we had no uh, pensions for uh, retirees and so on. So anyway, and then of course he helped to get us through the war. Go ahead, Beth. I have a question um, and I'll ask it on his behalf of from Tim of Virginia Beach. And he says with Jefferson's statute for religious freedom, he seems to unmoor the public servant's character from tightly wound religious ties. His question is, how does this play out during his presidency? I have a slide that I won't show you, but it's of Mount Rushmore. And I, I, I looked at the four presidents from a set of different perspectives. And one is religious. Jefferson was a deist and Jefferson was a Unitarian. So he was a Christian, but a kind of, I'd say, small C Christian. And he didn't ever divulge his religious views because he knew that would be divisive and he didn't want his own religious sensibilities to become an issue. So he was very private about that, even secretive about it. But people had this sense that he was an atheist and they really went after him in the, the election of 1800. The fundamental issue was whether Jefferson was an infidel, whether he was some sort of a, a filthy Frenchified atheist, atheist. And Jefferson never responded to it because he believed that that was nobody's business and that you're not going to gain anything by entering that um, debate anyway. So as president, he received a letter from the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, uh, who praised him for his free thinking ways, uh, for his tolerance of, 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 of religions that were not state religions like Congregationalism in Connecticut or Presbyterianism in Massachusetts or the Anglican Church in Virginia. And he responded with a famous letter uh, dated January 1st, 1803. And Jefferson said to the Danbury Baptists, My reading of the First Amendment is that it erects a wall of separation between church and state. And that phrase, wall of separation between church and state, has been adopted by. Uh, the court system of the United States, including the Supreme Court, as a nice paraphrase of the intentions of the Founding Fathers with respect to the First Amendment. And so Jefferson was very, very strong on that separation. Absolute freedom for anyone to worship any god they pleased or none, but he was extremely private about his own religious sensibilities. And so this was divisive, um, but there was nothing he could do about it because he believed so strongly that if the if your conscience is not free, then all of your other freedoms are likely to be uh, slowly taken away from you. And so he believed in absolute freedom of intellectual activity, including at the University of Virginia, which he designed, and freedom of conscience in every in every respect. Thank you. We'll go to Ted in New Jersey. Good afternoon. My question is about the election. Are we ever going to be able to go back to the days where we had elections, where the night of or the morning after somebody says, I concede, uh, or is, maybe it won't be as bad as this one, but it could be some form of, uh, let's do another recount and different things, go back and forth for another uh, two months, especially from my understanding is the Trump administration or any candidate made money out of this because if you contributed so much went to their pact or something, I'm not exactly sure how that all worked. So there's an built-in incentive. So how do we get back to some normalcy of a of a regular, somewhat of a regular election. I have an idea for that, but I want to ask David, you answer this question first. I think that's a very good question. And I'm going to make Clay answer it because he'll give you a better answer than I can. But I, I would just say that, I, you know, I think this is an anomaly. We talked earlier about divisive presidencies and singing the song of America. And I kind of bit my lip a little bit. To me, the song of America is optimism optimistic. It's inclusive. It's not divisive. I shy away from any political figure that uses divisiveness as a way to win or to uh, enforce his policies or sell his policies. So there's that. And then, then we come to this year's election. And I, I don't remember this kind of divisiveness over an election ever before in my lifetime. Um, I think this is very unusual. And I, I, I guess I would just say this too shall pass. Uh, I do think that it's good that voting is under scrutiny, 
that things are being double checked, that we're looking at, at it all to make sure that people can vote freely without consequence, without difficulty, and that we can trust our electoral system. But I think that's going to improve. I think everybody wants that, regardless of your party. So I'll, I'll hand it off to you, Clay. I agree with what you said. I think this is a, um, a blip. I, here's what I think we need. I think we need, a na- and there is something kind of percolating in the House. We need a National Voting Rights Clarification Act. There were some, I won't say irregularities in the 2020 election, but there were some oddities because of the pandemic and the emergency mail-in ballots and the long lines and 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 deadlines were waived because they wanted to make sure every vote got in and got counted. And so there's just enough Uh, I'm not going to say irregularity, but oddity in the whole thing to give conspiracy theorists uh, the power to say, look, look, we can't ever allow this to happen. So I would like to see a voting clarification act so that we can really figure this out and create a uniform standard of access for every American. And, you know, I I just want to say with some passion here that at the moment there are more than 100 bills in state legislatures for voter identification. And almost all of them are actually voter suppression laws. If we're going to have voter ID, and I'm all for it myself, then we need to make sure that we make it possible for every American to have an ID. And that turns out it's more difficult than it sounds. So there needs to be money put in. There needs to be an initiative to go through every county, every district, and find every voter, certify that they are a legal voter, and get them the ID that they need for free so that there is no effective disenfranchisement through voter identification laws. I think it's in our interest to make this happen. And I do think we need a commission to look at what happened in 2020. Um, I don't think they're going to discover much, but I want that um, certification and clarification. And then I think we need a very serious uh, voter law for the country that make, so that in 2024, no one can say, look, look what happened here. Look at these irregularities. I think we need to make sure that there is a, a uniform standard of voter access and participation. Ted from New Jersey. Great question. Thanks much. And I think we're moving on to Chris. I want to ask a question and and Clay, feel free or anybody to to answer this with, with specifically Jefferson in mind or, or any other president, but is there one aspect of, of Jefferson or, or another president's character that changed during his presidency? or came in without a particular characteristic and left with it, or came in with it and left without it, or completely changed during their presidency that stands out to you? It's a great question, uh, and I don't pretend to be an expert on the whole history of the presidency, but I know a few pretty well. Uh, So Jefferson didn't change much. He sort of, I always say that Jefferson sort of became Jefferson when he was around 20, He was reading 5, 10, 15 hours a day. He read basically the corpus of the Enlightenment, Voltaire and Rousseau and Dr. Johnson and Bolingbroke and Montesquieu and so on. And he established a worldview, and then he just kind of operated that worldview all the way out. Two things happened to him in the course of his life, not necessarily in the course of his presidency. One was sad, a hardening of his spiritual arteries with respect to slavery. He was a a pretty serious abolitionist when he was young and at the time of the Declaration of Independence and a little bit beyond that. And he got his fingers burned for those positions by his fellow Virginians. And he began to back off. And eventually, by the time of the War of 1812, he was really becoming more like a traditional Southern, not apologist for slavery, certainly, but somebody who was was not as uncomfortable with slavery as he had once been. And he wound up advocating the extension of slavery Uh, into the West in the Missouri Compromise of 1820. That's one thing. And secondly, Jefferson became a little disillusioned uh, when he saw that the grandchildren of the revolution were not taking us to a higher enlightenment. They were actually growing cotton and, um, and, 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 and really reading America as a land of economic opportunity more than this sort of special republic that was a very unusual Uh, achievement. Uh, Just to give you one other way to look at this, there are presidents who grow in office and there are presidents who diminish in office. And so a a president, for example, who grew in office is Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Before he became president, he was not particularly uh, against slavery. What he was against is the breakup of the union. And he said some things that sound like 
somebody who advocates apartheid at that point in his life, but he grew in office and he came to realize in the course of his first term that we really couldn't go on unless we wrestled slavery to the ground. And so he grew in office, and some do. You're listening to a special Zoom Town Hall version of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to our third and final segment of this week's Thomas Jefferson Hour Zoom Town Hall. And we so appreciate all of you who have chosen to participate this week. If you'd like to find out about a future Thomas Jefferson Hour Zoom Town Hall, go to jeffersonhour.com and we would welcome your attendance. Our next question comes from Michael, who is calling us from Virginia Beach. Clay, I was just, I, I didn't really have a question. I was I had a thought about something we were talking about earlier. I think it might have been Terry's question about how the election went um, this past time and will it ever go back to normal? And, and I think, you know, there was a perfect storm that happened there where uh, the pandemic forced states to sort of all of a sudden become the Pacific Northwest and have mail-in voting that hadn't happened so much except for certain absentees in Virginia, only a, if you had to have an excuse to get a, a mail-in ballot before that, you know, before last year. And so people who are used to seeing uh, the results come in that night, yeah. most states weren't prepared to count them until later. And we, we certainly went through that in Virginia. Uh, I'm an, as you know, I'm an elections official. So yeah. I think going forward, um, the infrastructure is now being built to handle that kind of voting. And I think a lot of people prefer that kind of voting. It's so much easier. And then a lot of states also adopted huge early voting programs that had never existed before. So, so many things changed in that election. And I think when a certain percentage of the population sees that and then are being told the election is stolen because look, the vote totals changed over three days, how could that be right? Um, I think that sort of fed into that. I couldn't agree more. That's fertile ground for conspiracy theories and so on. And so that's why I think we need a clarification law. Absolutely. Keep in mind that in these uh, 100 or so bills that are passing through state legislatures, many of them are attempting to explicitly outlaw mail-in voting. And so that's a fight that's not over yet. And and with the IDs, the... Um, in Virginia, when we had an ID, a photo ID law, which actually got uh, changed before the pandemic, um, in Virginia, they offered you a free photo ID if you didn't have one. And other states haven't been following the, that lead, which I think is a big different disenfranchisement of people. I agree. So, I mean, that's such an important thing here in North Dakota. We have a, a, a large minority population of Native Americans, and they live in isolated places, many of them. Uh, they have post office boxes rather than street addresses um, under which they get their mail. And they were being uh, written off voter uh, lists because of these issues. And so Heidi Heidkamp, who's a former North Dakota senator, spent a lot of time trying to get Native Americans signed up for IDs and genuine um, addresses so that they would not be turned away at the polls. And here are you know, perfectly good Americans who take the time and spend the money to go vote and then are turned away for reasons that really are artificial and designed, I believe, to turn them away. And so that's what we need to combat. We need to make sure, I mean, don't we all agree in some sense that everyone who is entitled to vote in this country should be able to vote in this country? You wouldn't think that that would ever be a controversial statement, but it turns out it is. Amen. Let's go to Barry. Yes. Hello. Um, I have the either misfortune or misfortune, however you want to look at it, of teaching government this year to uh, high school seniors. Uh, and it's certainly been challenging with the pandemic to begin with. And uh, it's been very interesting teaching that subject, uh, considering all the events that have happened since the election. Uh, I was teaching it last year, too. And I was last year, I was reading a book by Doris Goodwin Kearns uh, about, titled uh, Leadership in Turbulent Times. And um, I took some of the things out of that book and did a, a lesson last year on presidential leadership and focusing on uh, 
in her book, she focuses on FDR and Lincoln, uh, LBJ, and Theodore Roosevelt. And I took some of the information out of there, looking at how they fo- they faced various crisis situations in during the country. And I kind of revamped my lesson on January 6th and 7th, uh, because I knew my students would have a lot on their minds to talk about uh, regarding what happened in, in the Capitol. And uh, I hope to revisit uh, leadership later on in the year. But it, I forget how you put it earlier on, but you made the comment about how we seem to be becoming so much more partisan and so much more politically divisive. And uh, can we ever get back to a state where we look beyond those differences and are more able to compromise? So as a, as a high school teacher, I think it's going to have to start with the younger generation and us being able to get them to a point where they can understand differences in how we look at things doesn't mean you have to be at each other's throats. Looking at the leadership that we have in our country, I think is it's important too, because they're going to look up to these people and see how they react in crisis situations, or if there's a divisive issue, they're going to, they're going to wonder, okay, if this is how our leaders handle the situation, why should I handle it any different? Let me just quickly, um, say something about that that I feel very strongly about. And I'm writing a piece for governing. So governing.com is where you can find my occasional essays these days, if you're interested. Um, and it's about this very issue. And so, so I have a slightly odd view of it, but I don't think that we're necessarily more divisive, but I think we're more loud about our divisiveness than we used to be. And I think that the social media platforms and cable news and 24 seven and the silos of Fox and MSNBC and so on have given a megaphone to what Richard Nixon called silent Americans and what Donald Trump called forgotten Americans and people like Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and others have come into the world since around 1980 and they have created a voice and a megaphone for a lot of anger, rage, discontentment, and feeling of being left out or even being condescended to. And so now we're seeing when people have these megaphones, they're letting it rip. They they got a lot to get off their chests. They have a lifetime of things they want to get off their chests, and they're saying it. And I think we have to learn to respect that, even if we disagree with it. But I believe that over time, this will, this noise will, will get out. People will have expressed their rage. There's a cathartic effect of that. They will begin to calm down. I think this is just the heady stuff of people who have been silenced for a very long time by the establishment and they didn't like it, but they didn't know what to do about it because if they wrote an angry letter to the editor, the editor called and said, sorry, Barry, I can't publish that. Uh, That's just too crazy. If you tone it down, maybe I'll reconsider it. But now there is no such filter. And I think that this is both good news and of course, very disruptive news at the same time. But, But I live in a red, red state and I love my red neighbors more than they love me, frankly. Um, and I want to respect their rage. I don't entirely understand it, but I do not want to dismiss it because I think that is a fatal mistake. I think we need to figure out what is the deep discontentment, and we need to address it thoughtfully and respectfully. David, I know I'm speaking your language here. Yes, very much, and I would agree with with everything you said. I, first, I want to say, hey, Barry, good on you. You're an educator, and uh, Thanks for that. Um, One of the things that has come out of the pandemic that is positive is that people have begun to recognize and realize just how important teachers, professors, educators are. So, So I'll salute you for that. I have some optimism about this. I think that we are um, consumers of information in a way that humans have never been before. You know, we, we tend to forget that. There is so much information available to us since the dawn of radio, which was, you know, how long ago? We, we talked to Jefferson on the show often about newspapers and reporters and how people got information, and we are so bombarded with it. It's a business. I try to watch all sorts of different outlets. I really do. I watch Fox News, and I get disgusted because it's just so 
one-sided and harsh. I watch MSNBC and they're much better at it. They're much more fact-based and much more reasonable, but they are both after our attention. It's a business. You know, I, I look at NPR and, and go, yeah, that's much closer to what it ought, ought to be. So I think that inflates our feeling of hopelessness about how bad things are. I mean, you look at what just happened on January 6th. We were all disgusted by it as Americans, horrified by it, but it was a small group of people that did this and got all this attention. That's not the majority of the American public. I, I believe in it. A lot of it has to do with Clay and the Jefferson Hour. I believe most Americans are reasonable. Um, Clay just said he loves his red neighbors. You know, you can discuss things with people. It's the climate that we're in and this huge amount of information that we get that makes it seem impossible. I don't think it is. I, I'm an optimistic Aquarian. I'm holding on to that. And an Aquarian indeed. So I want to go to Ken Rubin. Ken, you're my five. My, you're you're my 401k Trumpite. You are you vote Republican usually. You're you're a fiscal conservative. Uh, I think you held your nose a couple of times recently in your elections. But you you believe there are many other reasons to vote for Donald Trump or for the Republicans than just Donald Trump. Right. And actually, I'd like to move off of Donald Trump. Here's my question. Given the bipolar nature of the two parties, uh, and, and they certainly are bipolar, don't you think the climate is very ripe now for a third party presidential candidate? And the reason I'm saying that is, and we've had John Anderson's and we've had Ross Perot's, but the access to the media now is not like it has been in the past. And if you believe that the median of the country is socially liberal and fiscal, con fiscally conservative. Don't you think the climate is now ripe for that type of candidate, presidential candidate, to emerge? And if you could, let's leave Donald Trump out of this whole well, thing. I can't quite, but I'm with you. That, you know, enough, enough already on Donald Trump. But uh, yes, yeah, so maybe you're right. The two most successful third-party candidates in American history were Ross Perot, who got 19... I believe, percent of the vote uh, and helped elect Bill Clinton. And then Theodore Roosevelt, who got 29 percent of the vote, the highest ever in American history in the 19, the famous 1912 election that featured R Roosevelt challenging uh, William Howard Taft for the Republican nomination and then bolting to form the progressive or the bull moose party. TR got 29 percent. That's amazing if you think about it, but it wasn't enough to get him elected. Uh, it was enough to cast Taft out and to elect Woodrow Wilson in his place. Uh, I, and I'm only going to say this much about Donald Trump. I hope you'll forgive it, Ken. I think he was our third party candidate. I think he is essentially not a Republican and not a Democrat. He's Donald Trump. And he, and he, and he represents that vast army of angry uh, populists and, of course, Republicans who had nowhere else to turn. But I think he was essentially a third party candidate working through the two party system. And it would have been better for everybody if it were just a third party. I do hope we do one. I think, uh, I feel very strongly we need a serious and mature conservative party in this country. And I don't think that the Republicans at the moment are that. I think they're, they're locked in a pretty severe internal civil war and who knows how it's exactly going to come out, but we need a responsible conservative party, and we don't now have one. And so maybe a third party is your answer, Ken. Thanks, Ken. I'm going to look to Pamela. Hey, ho, Pamela Hagan. Hello. I'm wondering, you mentioned um, Jefferson wanting a national education. Where do you think America would be today if we had to have one? Well, what he wanted, uh, maybe I misspoke, he wanted a national university. He was a state's rightist, so he believed that each state should handle its own education. In fact, he believed that each locality should handle its own. And I, I have some sympathy with that point of view. You know, educating our children is almost the most important thing that happens. And so we should have a pretty strong uh, capacity to determine how that education looks and who gets hired. But at any rate, Jefferson wanted a national university. So did Washington, by the way. Washington, in his farewell address, said we need a national university. And, and it was the idea that we would have, it would be a, an example to the rest of the country, but it also would train um, a government class of people, it's, you know, it would be high civics training for people that would become the, um, the effective leaders 
both in bureaucracy and in, in an elective government. And so Washington didn't get it. Jefferson wanted it, and of course he went on to design what became a national university, the University of Virginia, which is always regarded now as one of the top 10 institutions of higher education in the country, if not the world. So he got, in a sense, what he had in mind. But here's why he wouldn't give us a national university. Jefferson said, no, first we have to pay off the national debt, and then we have to have an amendment that enables us to have a national university. As a strict constructionist, Jefferson thought that we could only do those things that were especially and particularly enumerated in the Constitution. And since uh, higher ed education was not enumerated in Article One, Jefferson felt that the only way that that great idea could come to pass is with an enabling amendment. And Hamilton looked at this, at this quality in Jefferson and said, are you nuts? If we have to amend the Constitution every time we have a new idea, we'll never get anywhere. And so Jefferson was sort of hamstrung by his own ideology on that score. Uh, Raymond. Raymond in Virginia. Yeah, thank you, Clay. Uh, I did have one question, um, circling back around to the character of presidents. It's, it's my understanding that uh, one of Jefferson's first law clients involved a, a manumission case or a slave case or something. And I was wondering what the... Uh, how that impact his character or approach to um, freedom and, or, and as well as his political ambitions. Yeah, I think this was 1771. It was the Samuel Howell case. So Samuel Howell was what was then called a mulatto, partly black and partly white. And his great grandmother, no, his grandmother had been a white woman who had a child with a black man. And under Virginia's laws at the time, that meant that her children were slaves, and then her children's children were slaves under Virginia law. And Jefferson took the case on behalf of Samuel Howell. Uh, unfortunately, he was up against his old law professor, George Wythe, who was one of the greatest law professors in American history. And, and in the case, Jefferson argued that uh, under natural law, all men are born equal. He didn't even get to finish his argument. The case was thrown out, and Samuel Howell was returned into slavery. And Jefferson learned a very important lesson from that, which was that Virginia was not going to go along at that time with any of Jefferson's wilder ideas about human equality and freedom. And so he, he made a valiant attempt to argue that this young man, through no fault of his own, it's like DACA or Dreamers, this young man had been born into the world, and why should he be punished for something that happened two generations previous to him for, over which he had no control and so Jefferson believed, said that all men are born equal, but the case was summarily dismissed, and Jefferson sort of realized, okay, um, I see where I see where Virginia is, and he began to temporize to sort of pull back a little on his more emancipationist views. It's a really interesting case. I strongly urge you to take a look at it. Sadly, we need to bring this Zoom town hall to a close for this week. We so appreciate your listening. And please join us next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.